singing Blessed Assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste the glory divine. Heir of salvation, precious of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my soul. be seated. Good to see you here tonight. I'm glad you're with us as we conclude the day in the Lord's house. I just want to uh, highlight, uh, again, most of, the, most of the announcements have to do with uh, the homecoming that's coming up, and just encourage you to take a look at that uh, and where it applies to you, take action when it comes to sign-up sheets and things that are needed uh, and those kind of issues. There is, a, there is a ladies' night on October 3rd. we still got some time for that uh, on Monday, October 3rd, for uh, Operation Christmas Child Packing Party. So just to, to make you aware of, of some of those things. But be in, be in prayer for our homecoming. Be prepared for our homecoming. Uh, take action uh, for that uh, as it's right around the corner. And we want to pray for uh, the Randolphs. I got to see Bob and Grace for a little bit on Friday afternoon. And just keep them in your prayers. Uh, and um, I had the Ponder reunion. It was great seeing some of those folks here this morning, but it reminded me of Brother Dale and, uh, and others, Miss Gladys Kirby, other shut-ins that we have, and we want to uh, hold them up before the Lord. And uh, my, my dad's had another setback. Uh, I'm telling you that just so that you can pray about it, but also as soon as the service is dismissed tonight, uh, my family, we're, we're going to be heading up there. Stephen's going to lock up for me tonight, so uh, I'm going to be... Uh, we're going to be headed up that way as soon as the uh, uh, as soon as the service is dismissed, and I'll be gone uh, most of the week. I'll be back at the end of the week, Lord willing, but I'll be gone most of the week. Um, Dad's got an infection in his blood, and uh, he has to be treated uh, with IV antibiotics for that. And so we're just going to see uh, you know uh, how that plays out. But um, there's going to be a special treat for you on Wednesday night. My dad's pastor. When last time Dad was in the hospital, he and I were together. He came and, he came and sat with us for a while while we were at the hospital. And his associate uh, is preaching on Wednesday nights, and he offered, uh, if ever I needed him to step in for me at short notice, he'd be willing to do that. And you all know him. That's Brother Sparks. So he's going to preach Wednesday. He's going to come down uh, and preach Wednesday uh, while I'm gone. So, so if you would, keep them in your prayers and keep these other requests uh, uh, before the Lord. Anybody else we need to pray about tonight before we go to the Lord and, and, and continue to sing? Oh, I know one thing. 
Bible release time. I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with that. That's a new program in this county. It's been in eastern Kentucky. It's been in eastern Tennessee. And we were going, uh, it's just now being introduced into Rockcastle County. There's a nonprofit organization in Tennessee that, you know, there, there's allowed to be biblical instruction for students during the school day in Kentucky. Um, uh, I think especially if it's off-site. I don't know if it has to be off-site. I forget some of those details. But the, this Elgin, this nonprofit group called Elgin, they, uh, they pay the, uh, the, for, the bus, uh, for the buses and the bus drivers and all these things to transport these kids to an off-site location for, uh, for an hour, an hour from the time that they leave the school. So from the time they load the buses until the time they unload the buses is one hour. And we were going to be one of the schools. Uh, we were going to be for Roundstone. First Baptist was uh, Mount Vernon Elementary. Um, Broadhead, obviously, was going to be uh, Broadhead uh, Elementary. And we were going to be Roundstone, but we were just too far. It was about a half hour by bus round trip, and that leaves less time for the kids to have the instruction and everything. So, uh, so Grace Baptist Church uh, um, stepped up, and they were going to be the, uh, uh, and, are, and are still not, we're going to be, but they are going to be the church where that's the Bible release time program goes on. But uh, I, I haven't been on Facebook in a while, but I guess there's been a kerfluffle uh, in the community uh, about all that. Uh, it's a shame that those kind of things happen. You know, somebody's going to argue and complain about uh, kids, uh, not on the taxpayer's dime, but on a nonprofit's dime, uh, and it's a special it's a special thing for the kids. It's kind of like a field trip for them, and get to have uh, uh, some biblical instruction and some biblical encouragement. Uh, and I guess there's been a, a stink raised on some level about that. And I don't know all the details. I just I've just been re somebody called me yesterday and filled me in on a little bit of it, asked me to pray about that situation. So uh, let's pray about that as a church. Um, I, I'm, I'm thankful that they're driving on. I think there's going to be a school board meeting about that, and there may be, <laughs> there's been threats of a, some protests or whatever else, you know. Um, but I, I think it's a good thing. I, first of all, I think it's a good thing that the state of Kentucky, that, that our commonwealth allows for um, students to have an hour of Bible instruction. Amen? Amen. I think that's great. And I think it's great that there's opportunities for that. And so let's pray that that goes forward uh, for, the, for all these kids in Rockcastle County and for these churches that are able to uh, take leadership in that. Uh, and, you know, however we can help, um, you know, uh, I, I want us to be able to help even though we're not going to be a primary location for instruction. And that's what I told this individual uh, on the phone last night. However we can help, we want, we want to help. Um, so, but keep that in your, in your prayers if you would. And let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer right now before we continue on with our worship service. Brother Danny, why don't you please some prayer? Lord, we thank you that you have granted us another opportunity to work together here tonight. Thank you for the music that we've already heard, Lord. We just pray that as we continue this service, that uh, Lord, we might have our hearts tuned to you, we might listen to the word that's to be preached tonight. Lord, that you give us the words you have us to hear. Lord, for these who have been mentioned, they're sick. We especially pray for Brother Jim right now, Lord, that you would be with him. And Lord, that be with his family, be with James. May us go through these trials. Just pray that uh, you would help them, Lord. Lord, we just uh, pray for the others, Bob and Grace, and Bob Lux for Lord, and uh, for Ms. Oaks, that has been mentioned so many times here in Sil the Sylvania, Eddie's sister, that you'd be with each of those, Lord. You know that circumstances, you know the needs, you know you will, Lord, just pray that you might touch them. Lord, for this uh, situation that Brother Travis has just mentioned, we just pray that this Christian might stand, Lord, and stand uh, up against those who are fighting yes. these things, that we might uh, take a stand for you, and that we might be real. We're not like the known and fast of the prayer and schools and reading the Bible, Lord, that we might let our voices be heard make these decisions we know that we care. Just pray now that you go with us and you forgive us with your faith. And I see some things down there.
Oh, 
safely home by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, bought me with his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Let's pray before we take our seats. Father, uh, that's, that's our desire, that we, we want to come before you, and we want to be blessed by your goodness and your grace, and we want to be uh, used for your glory and, and your honor for the good of others. And so, Father, as we open up our Bibles and open them up, open them up again uh, to, the book, to the book of Jonah, uh, Father, help us to take a familiar tale and uh, not approach it um, uh, as if we've, we've heard it for the thousandth time, but to come to it, Father, with an open heart and an open mind to glean what your word has to tell us and teach us and demonstrate to us uh, this evening. And may it change us uh, for your glory and for our good and for the cause of Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. You may be seated. You can take your Bibles and open them up to Jonah. Uh, and uh, I'm also going to read, and you can, you can find this place in your Bibles too. I'm going to read Matthew chapter 12, a few verses from that in just a little bit. And I think that will fit with us, uh, what we're talking about uh, this, this evening from the book of Jonah. One of the most familiar stories of the Old Testament. And it, the, the reason it is is because we're always fascinated with the fantastic uh, I'm sure, uh, I, I know Brother uh, Staten had told me this when he would preached uh, 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 sermons from Revelation. It was always very, um, uh, very popular with, uh, of course, it's totally different today. You don't have to order a tape or order a CD even. You can just go download it from the website. But I know when Brother Sparks preached through the book of Revelation, it was one of the most well-attended of his uh, series and also one of the most requested tapes that, uh, of any book, and, and, and Brother Sparks has preached through the entire New Testament. He's preached from, uh, from Matthew to the Revelation. And so it's because, we, it's because we're fascinated with the fantastic. And there's no doubt about it, the four little chapters of Jonah uh, form a fantastic story, mainly because of what we're about to read this evening, the story of Jonah and the big fish. But, but the, main the main theme of this narrative is not a huge fish. The main theme of this narrative is not even disobedience or repentance. Those are all there, but they don't form the core. They don't form the central idea. The main theme in Jonah is the relentless compassion of God for sinners. That's the main theme. God's relentless compassion is, is then contrasted with Jonah's reluctance. So you have, G, you have God's relentlessness co, uh, contrasted with Jonah's reluctance. God is relentless in his compassion, and Jonah is reluctant in his ministry. And then studying this book provides us with a ringside seat to the stubbornness of sin versus the sovereignty of God. We talked about the stubbornness of sin this morning. We're going to see the sovereignty of God this evening. Because no matter how stubborn Jonah's sin was, and it was stubborn, <laughs> throw me over, throw me overboard, God's sovereignty trumped it all. So chapter 1 ends with Jonah, or almost ends, verse 16, with Jonah deciding to be known as the throw-me-overboard prophet of Israel. This mouthpiece of Almighty Jehovah defiantly chose death, he thought, over obedience. And, it, uh, and, and what we have then is uh, 
Jonah being thrown over uh, the, the sideboards by these mariners. And I just wonder, uh, I just wonder as, as, as he started to sink into the water, I wonder if he even smiled in his stubbornness at the idea that he was going to get over on God and say to himself, I guess I won't be going to Nineveh after all. We don't know. I like to find out when I get to glory. But I'm wondering if he's thinking as he's sinking down uh, into the water, guess, guess who wins, God? I'm not going to Nineveh. That's, that may have been what he thought, but he was mistaken because look at verse 17 of Jonah chapter 1. Remember, he just got thrown over the, uh, the sideboards, and here's what we read in verse 17. Now the who? The Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now let's take a little time to talk about that fish. Was this fish just some incidental detail? Not at all. There are no incidental details with God. There are no coincidences with God. I, 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 was, uh, I was listening to a, a sermon uh, Saturday uh, morning. It, um, you know, I, I need to be preached to as well. And I was listening to a sermon Saturday morning, and it, it was affirming because it uh, reinforced what I, uh, something that I like to say on a regular basis. But the preacher, who was uh, Tony Evans uh, from Dallas, he said there are three words that are not Christian words. And he, he said luck, fate, and chance. Luck, fate, and chance. They're not Christian words. And I said amen. And I've said something similar myself. And I try to keep myself from using those words. It's, sometimes it's difficult when we use those words on a regular basis. But he said, he said luck, fate, and chance, those, those aren't Christian words. He said the Christian word to use is providence. Providence. And, and, and I was thinking about that as I was rereading Jonah yesterday, thinking about today. So the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. You know, there aren't any coincidences with God. There aren't incidental uh, accidents with God. There aren't happenstances. That's not how God works. Everything with God is purposeful and for his glory and for his people's good. Jonah being swallowed up by a great fish is no exception. So hold your place there because I want to show you one of the reasons why this is so uh, purposeful. Hold your place there in Jonah chapter 1, Jonah chapter 2, and look to the New Testament in Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 40, we learn about the intentionality behind Jonah being swallowed by the fish. Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 40. During Christ's ministry, he was challenged by his opponents to provide a sign that would divinely validate the authenticity of his ministry, as if his birth Baptism, miracles, preaching, the testimony of John the Baptist and other events weren't validation enough. Those who opposed him, it's because they didn't really care about validation. They're just, they're just throwing up roadblocks or trying to. Yeah, they, they wanted a sign. And, jo and Jesus pointed to Jonah to answer his skeptics. So Matthew chapter 12, look at verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so here we have this detail from the Old Testament, this issue of Jonah being swallowed up by the great fish hundreds of years later, Jesus used it as a reference, as an authentic, authentication of his ministry. The fish has everything to do with God. It wasn't just a coincidence or happenstance. Uh, a little bit later on, you can look there in verse 41, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah, talking about himself, is here. So, so Jonah and the fish foreshadows the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the men of Nineveh will be used by God to pronounce judgment on the hard-hearted religious skeptics of Jesus' day because a greater than Jonah was preaching to them and they would not listen to what he had to say. So it's very important for us to remember this. 
When God asks us to do something, and you can look back at Jonah in your Bibles, when God asks us to do something, we must not be um, refusing it. We must not be whiny and grumpy and petty about it. We need to understand that it's for our good and for his glory. That's the primary thing. And, and, and realizing that it's for whatever he's asking us to do, that it's for our good and for his glory, we should joyfully do it. Because God is in the details working things out uh, uh, as he sees fit. The relentless compassion of God for sinners. God's will to use his people in compassion transactions is the primary theme of Jonah. And a major sub-theme is that God is sovereign, managing the details of our lives, the good, the bad, the indifferent, the obedience and the rebellion. God rules and overrules in all the details of our life, all the details of history to, to ultimately bring about his good in the end. Now, that doesn't mean that God is the author of sin. God isn't the author of sin. God is the solution of sin, if that makes sense. I hope it does. What I want us to understand, even, even sin, someone else's sin or even my sin is not going to be a, a hiccup in God's plan. It's not going to thwart God's plan. He is going to even overrule that to bring about his purposes. And that should bring comfort to our hearts and our minds. It certainly does mine. And, and that's exactly what we see in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the life of Jonah here. Think about it this way, uh, uh, and this is something else I heard yesterday as I was uh, just kind of refreshing myself. Um, uh, um, it's an illustration I'd heard before, but I forgot. You know, it's good to be reminded of what we already know. That's what happens a lot of times with sermons. Uh, and, and, and I've heard this illustration before, and I haven't even used it, uh, but I'd forgotten about it. But the sovereignty of God, is God's, God's hand is in the glove of history, bringing about his purposes for his glory uh, and for the good of his people. And, 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 and I don't think there's, a, there's, another, there's not a better illustration of that in the Old Testament than what's going on with Jonah right here. But what happens when a believer... What happens when a believer is not trying to stand on the solid rock, but is instead trying to jump off into the sinking sand? What happens in that case? Well, here's what happens in that case. The Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Any parent understands uh, that the way to correct disobedience is to uh, address the situation, to not just let it continue to go on, uh, but, but to deal with it. And, and to make whatever correction is necessary and that the kid is not going to appreciate the correction because they want to continue on in their disobedience. But we need to, as parents, make sure that we address the disobedience so it can be corrected, not just for our purposes, but for the good of the child. And that's exactly what God does with our sin. God does not let us continue. Oh, yeah, we can continue on for a while. Uh, uh, he, he will leave, leave us go according to his plan, sometimes for a while, sometimes for a short time. But he is going to take action. He is going to take action. And that's exactly what happened with Jonah here in this situation. Sin causes despair, but God alone will provide hope and assurance. But this hope and assurance will only be found, this is what I want you to understand. This is, this is the message um, um, in, in, a, in a sentence. This is the main idea of the message. Sin causes despair, but God alone is able to provide hope and assurance. And we need to understand that hope and assurance will only be found as we come to Christ in repentant faith. And so we read at the end of chapter 1 that the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, and then I love it. I, I, I don't know if it's a sense of humor on God's part or not, but it sure makes me smile. The first words of Jonah chapter 2 is, then Jonah prayed. You bet he did. You bet he did. He's in the belly of a great fish for three days and three nights. It's amazing to me that it took him uh, three days and three nights. That is evidence of the stubbornness of sin. But here's what God's word has to say. We'll pick it up in verse 2. And said, here's his prayer, I cried, by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me, notice that, for thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and all thy waves passed over me. 
That sounds very familiar to me, if you like Psalm 42 anyway. Then I said, verse 4, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compass me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountain. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake thy own mercy. And he's talking about himself to a degree. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that, that, that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And as we study this prayer of Jonah, we must, remember, we must remember that God has an agenda for Jonah's life. God has a plan. God has a purpose. And it was that Jonah needed to go to Nineveh to proclaim the gospel. That was God's plan and purpose for Jonah. Now, Jonah didn't like that plan and purpose. And that's why he was in this stubborn rebellion. But that's exactly what God's plan for him was. Him, that's, that's what his plan was for Jonah. And Jonah's sin was that his own agenda was far more important to him than God's agenda. And he needed to repent for that. He needed to repent for valuing his agenda over God's. And so that brings us to the first aspect of Jonah's prayer. Let's take a look at it. And Jonah prayed, and here's what we learn from Jonah's prayer. We learn of the assurance of deliverance. You see it there in, in, in verse 2? We must come to God in repentance and we must come to him and repent us with the unflinching assurance that if we repent, he will deliver us, he will forgive. I cried by reason of mine infliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell. And, and it doesn't mean that he was in hell literally. It's a symbolic statement talking about the grave, talking about the depths of darkness. It was as if to him he was in hell. And you heard my voice, God. It's, it's the strong assurance that we have when we come to him for repentance. There is no doubt when a sinner comes to Christ, confessing and repenting of their sins, that he will forgive them. We should never doubt that. And what a great encouragement that is. Because not everybody will forgive us, unfortunately. Not everybody's going to uh, be reconciled to us as much as we would like it. But that's never the case with the Lord. God delivers those who are captured and lost in sin, and when they come to him in repentant faith, he receives them. Whether it's a lost person needing to be saved or a saved person needing to be restored. And so there's all these questions that we have at times like this. Don't you know what I've done? Don't you know what I've done? Or, or, or how many times do you think you can come and ask God to forgive you for this? These are the things that the enemy tells us. These are the things that run through our minds that cause us to be deceived by doubt, these accusations. Aren't you totally ashamed of what you've done? Look at how you've messed up. Wouldn't it be better if you just didn't bring this up? Wouldn't it be better if you just didn't bring this before the Lord? And beloved, when those kind of accusations from the enemy and whatever voice they're coming into your mind, even if they're coming in your own voice, and you hear these accusations, be reminded that no matter what ha has happened or what you've done, if you are sincere in your desire to be forgiven and to be restored and to be reconciled, God will hear you. He will forgive and you will be restored. I love 1 John 1, 9. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, which means that we're going to sin, and he's talking to believers. If we confess our sins, he is, do you know what the, what the next word is? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <laughs> Praise God for our forgiving king. And Jonah's prayer teaches us the assurance of deliverance. And it, it also provides us an awareness of God's discipline. This is what Jonah's prayer is teaching us. It teaches us the assurance that we will be delivered if we seek it. Which also is a reminder that we need to have that same mindset with one another. And then it also teaches us the awareness of God's discipline. Many times, many times when I got spanked, and Dad, Dad was normally the spanker, although uh, Mom was not hesitant at all to lay the wood to her son uh, when it was necessary. And it was necessary a lot. 
And many times when dad would spank me, or especially when mom would, uh, they would say something like this, Travis, this is for your own good. Uh, uh, dad would say that a lot. Uh, mom would say, you know, this is going to uh, uh, hurt you uh, more than it hurts me. Uh, I definitely never believed that one. Uh, I, I didn't buy that at all. But the Bible says something similar. The Bible says something similar when this is for your own good. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, now no chastening, that's King James in English for discipline. That's King James in English for, um, I don't like to use the word punishment when it, comes to, uh, when it comes to God's interaction with believers because believers' sin has, uh, and y'all can think about this, you can work this out on your own through the week, but believers' sin has already been punished in Jesus Christ. But believers do get disciplined. Believers do get corrected, but that's, uh, or as the King James says, chastened. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? I don't think Jonah was having a good time in the belly of the great fish. But it's grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them. This is one of my favorite King James phrases, which are exercised thereby. The Bible makes it clear that no discipline of God is pleasant for the moment. Our Heavenly Father will chasten us, and our Heavenly Father will use what I call secondary sources to make us aware that we need to be, repent. But if we're not careful, we will miss the point of God's discipline because we get angry at the secondary sources. So the secondary, here's my example, the secondary source in Jonah's life is the fish that swallowed him up. And Jonah didn't make the mistake. Jonah didn't make the mistake at getting aggravated at the fish or the mariners who threw him overboard or the storm that caused the whole thing to happen or any of those things. We don't see any of that in Jonah's prayer. He's not angry with the mariners. He's not angry with uh, the fish. I mean, in fact, um, Jonah could have said, when the mariners came to him, what should we do? And he said, throw me overboard because I'm the problem. We read that this morning from the end of chapter 1. And then when they picked him up and they tossed him over, he could have said, well, I didn't, I didn't think you'd take me serious. I didn't really think you'd throw me into the storm. But that's not what he did at all. He prayed, and you see that there in verse 3. I, I, I highlighted it. Um, look, look at it with, with me again in verse 3. For, what's the, what's the next word used? For thou threw me, I'll update to King's English, for you threw me into the deep. Now, we know from chapter 1, who was it that physically put Jonah into the water? The mariners. They are the secondary source. They're not the problem. They're not the one that Jonah should be angry with. They're not the issue. His sin is the issue. And God is disciplining him for his sin. And the secondary source, in this case, is the mariners who toss him overside. And then he says, uh, you uh, cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compass me about. And then, I love it again, in verse 3, all your billows and all your waves passed over me. See, God is the one who's in control of seas and storms and waves and winds. And Jonah knew exactly what was going on. And he knew why. This was all about the hand of God and the glove of history ruling and overruling in his life for God's glory and for Jonah's good. God was in control here. And he was being disciplined because of, uh, and he was disciplining Jonah because of Jonah's stubborn sin. Um, I don't have this on the screen, but Hebrews chapter 12, the same passage that talks about the chastening of God that we just read earlier, says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And um, Psalm, uh, Psalm 42, I'm going to look at that even though I'm, just, I'm right there near there, make sure I get it uh, read verbatim and, and not uh, mess with it. But Psalm 42, Psalm 42 verse 7, deep calleth unto deep, at the noise of thy water spouts, all thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Psalm 42 is one of my favorite psalms because, like I've said before, it all the psalms teach us to think and to feel. 
God's thoughts and God's feelings. This teaches us how we need to uh, uh, negotiate these things. And we all have the, I mean, we all get depressed. We all get discouraged. Uh, Martin, yeah, Martin Lloyd-Jones, a uh, famous preacher in England in the early part of the 20th century, uh, has written an entire book, uh, Depression and Its Causes, which is largely based on an exposition of Psalm 42. It's an excellent book. And it's important for us to understand that as the psalmist is struggling here with, with depression and despair, he preaches to himself, why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you disquieted in me? And here's the answer. The answer is not your circumstances changing or whatever else. Here's the answer, hope in God. For I, shall yet, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance, for the help of his salvation. And then not long after that, the psalmist reminds us, reminds himself that deep calls to deep at the noise of God's water spouts, God's waves, God's billows that are gone over me. They're afflicting me. See, the great fish was God's rod of correction for his wayward prophet. And it had its intended effect because Jonah was running to Tarshish instead of going to Nineveh. But after being swallowed by the wet, uh, fish and spit up on the dry land, Jonah was ready to go to Nineveh. He couldn't wait to get there. Now, I'm not suggesting, and please don't hear what I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting that every time we stub our toe or every time something negative happens in our life that we're being disciplined by God. I don't mean that. I'm not suggesting that every negative thing in life is due to some specific sin in your life. What I'm saying is we must continually confess our sin and we must continually confess our sin and not blame others, including God, for the divine discipline that's a result of our own disobedience. Does that make sense? That's what's going on here. And as, as the reluctant missionary prayed from the belly of of the great fish that was prepared for him by God for just this occasion. You know, people always want to ask, well, well what, kind of, what, kind of, what kind of fish was that? What kind of, was it a whale? Was it a fish? You know, Jesus, uh, probably quoting from the uh, Septuagint, you know, he, he, uh, the word whale is used in Matthew 12. We read it. It's a great fish here uh, in, in Jonah um, uh, chapter 2. And people want to, you know, what's the classification? Would it, you know, it, it's, I, I don't know. It could be this. It could have been the only one of its kind that God had prepared for just this purpose. Right? I mean, he's the creator of all things. He's not bound by anything except his own word. And he could have, this could have been, I, I'm not saying that it was, but this could have been a fish that uh, was the only one of its kind, and it was specifically for this purpose. Here's what I know. Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. It's not an allegory. It happened. Jesus pointed it out. And, uh, and, and he was in the belly of that fish for this purpose. And we may be assured of God's deliverance. We may be and should be aware of God's discipline. And then here's the third thing, and we're halfway home. We need to recognize that without God, we have no hope. Without God, we have no hope. You, we saw that specifically in verses 3 through 6. When we read that passage, it vividly conveys. It, it's very graphic language that Jonah uses to convey the real despair that he experienced in the belly of that great fish. His only hope was God. And a lot of times, that's what God's discipline is, do, is, is doing in our lives. It is reminding us that the only hope we have is God. The only hope. And that's true for all of us, no matter the situation. No matter whether you're a stubborn prophet who's going the other way, no matter whether you have uh, an illness that medicine says it's just uh, impossible to improve, whatever the situation may be, whether you're, whether you're hot, riding high on the mountain and everybody's seeing your praises or whether you're down in the valley and they're all trying to throw dirt on your body while you're still alive, whether you're, whether you're wounded or, or, or whether you're healthy, uh, it, it doesn't matter what the situation is. Our only hope is God. And we quoted this verse this morning, but Proverbs 14, 12 
Also repeated in 1625, there is a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And if we had talked to Jonah in Joppa, if we had talked to Jonah in Joppa, he would have told us that what he was doing was absolutely the right thing. Said Jonah, uh, I just, uh, you, I'm, uh, I'm not a part of this. This is not, this is not my area, but I just kind of get the sense that it, it seems to me, I know you're the mouthpiece of God and you've been used during Jeroboam's uh, um, reign uh, mightily for the Lord's hand, but uh, it seems to me, I've kind of learned that you were supposed to go to Nineveh and I know there are enemies, and there are wicked people. I mean, they, they've damaged my family. They've done hurt to my family. But I, yeah, I found out that I think you're supposed to go to Nineveh. That's what I've heard, and you're supposed to cry out against their wickedness. And he would have said to you there on the docks at Joppa that what he was doing was absolutely the right thing to do. That he wasn't going to go to Nineveh, and he had all the reasons why. But then, in the belly of that great fish, when the despair begins to set in and he had no place left to go, right? There's, no, there's nobody else to turn to. There's no other option. There's no place left but to look to God. He recognized that what seemed right to him in Joppa and on the boat and even getting thrown overboard what seemed right to him was wrong because it was contrary to God's will. Not because of any other thing. Not because of any other perception. Not because it was unpopular. Not because it was countercultural. Not because of anything of that nature. But because it was contrary to God's will. Because I can guarantee you this. There would have been a lot of people in Israel back in that day who would have been very happy that Jonah was disobedient to God because they, like the prophet, didn't want to see the Ninevites rescued. Right? Absolutely. And Jonah learned that lesson. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came unto thee, into thine holy temple. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came up to thee, into thy holy temple. What about us? What about us? The assurance of God's deliverance is what Jonah's prayer teaches us. Call out to God sincerely, and he will hear you, and he will deliver you. This is also uh, an, an awareness of God's discipline. There's no doubt about that. That's exactly what's happening here. Here's another thing that's without doubt. There is no hope except for in God. And then finally... And here we, here we bring it to a close. The determination to do what's right. That's what's repeated there in verses 8 and 9. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. What does it mean to repent? That's what we need to, uh, that's what we need to answer tonight before we close. You know, a popular but wrong answer is that repenting is um, just kind of really feeling rotten about something and really having a bad, uh, a bad reaction to something or sad about something, uh, maybe even weeping deep tears of sorrow. And I think all those, uh, I think all those reactions can be, an, can be aspects of repentance, no doubt, De especially depending upon how you're wired because all of us are wired a little differently. So all those things can be aspects of repentance. But, uh, but repentance, true repentance, is transformation. True repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of action and change of direction. So it's, it, it's I'm going this way, but I've changed my mind about going this way, but I haven't just changed my mind because I can be walking this way and I can have in my mind, you know, I probably shouldn't walk this way. This is not the best way to walk and keep walking this way, right? But repentance is going this way and then having my mind changed about going this way and then turning and going in the opposite direction. That's repentance. F turning repentance and faith. 
Those are three key words to help us understand how we are to respond to the gospel. It's not just... It's not just having a, an, an intellectual understanding that you're a sinner and that Jesus is a Savior and that he died. You need to have that. But, it's, but, your, but that faith needs to be evidenced by turning from your uh, sin and repenting uh, um, and, and, follow, and, and putting your faith in Christ. It's what, it's what Paul said in Acts 20:21. 20, um, repentance from sin and faith in Christ turning from sin and repentance and turning to Christ in, in faith. That's what true repentance is, and true repentance brings transformation. It's changing how we think about something and then changing how we live because we no longer think the way we used to think. Remember, we talked on Wednesday night, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, they had turned from serving false gods to serving the living and true God. And the fact that they had quit serving these false gods of Thessalonica, of the Greco-Roman world, and began serving the one true God, that faith, that evidence of, uh, of faith, which is repentance, was sounded out throughout all Macedonia, Achaia, and to the uttermost parts of the world. So repentance is not, a, um, uh, repentance is not just a, a, a do-it-and-yourself uh, job. It can only be done by the prodding of the Holy Spirit. And so he says, he says there in Jonah, I will sacrifice I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. And we, and we need to note that Jonah said he would sacrifice unto God with a voice of thanksgiving. One of the true marks of repentance is gratitude to God. You can always tell if somebody is repentant because they have a grateful spirit. Grateful that God has cleansed them and delivered them. And then he says, I have I will pay that, that, I, that I have vowed. It's, it's a weird, it, it, it's hard for me to say it anyway. I will pay that that I have vowed. It's a, strange, it's a strange statement. Well, what had Jonah vowed? Look at it again. I will pay that that I have vowed. I've asked myself that question. You know, what, what did Jonah vow? And we don't have a specific thing that he'd vowed. But here's what we know. What was Jonah? A prophet. He was a prophet of Almighty Jehovah. A prophet is a mouthpiece, a preacher. And God says, this is what you preach, and this is where you preach it. And the prophet said, not today. Not today. That was the call of God on his life a commitment to proclaim God's truth, a commitment that Jonah attempted to abandon, but praise God, one that he here reclaimed. And so then we bring, it, we bring it to the conclose. The Lord is our only hope. That's what he says. Salvation, that's how verse 9 ends. The last sentence of verse 9, salvation is of the Lord. The Lord is the only hope of salvation that has existed, that does exist, that will ever exist. Are you counting on a friend to save you? Maybe more money. Maybe uh, uh, maybe a new uh, maybe a, a new uh, pers not not perspective, but a, 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 new, a new situation. Maybe you could lie your way out of your trouble. I mean, deceit might be your only hope, or a new job might be your only hope. Or a significant other might be your only hope. Or a new major at, at, at the university. Or a new look. You need to change the way you look. Or maybe you need to shed a few pounds. And maybe you think that's your only hope. It's what I like to call the Obi-Wan Kenobis of the world. Yeah, if you're not a Star Wars fan, you don't get it. But in the original movie, the movie that, um, that I just absolutely blew, that absolutely blew me over when I was a kid, that's, that was the key line from the entire movie. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You are my, what? Only hope. And Psalm 42, 5, remember what it says. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted in me? Hope thou in God. And that's what Jonah affirms. He had one hope. 
Salvation comes of the Lord. We have one hope. Salvation comes of the Lord. Eternal salvation, yearly salvation, monthly salvation, weekly salvation, moment by mo moment salvation, it all comes from the Lord and from the Lord alone. And so Romans 8.26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Sometimes we don't even know what to pray. And, and I hate to bring this stuff up all the time, but I was praying with the family over FaceTime. Sometimes I just am so thankful for technology, and we're all there together, and I'm sitting at my kitchen table, and I'm looking into my, I'm looking into my laptop screen, and they're all, they're all looking into their phone, and we're having this conversation, and we're praying together. And this is exactly, Romans 8, 26 is exactly one of the things I prayed. And I said to God Almighty, I, I don't even know what to say. I, I don't even know what to say, except our hope is in you. And Jonah gives us this paradigm to follow for our prayers of repentance. And the paradigm has these four segments that we talked about tonight. God will deliver us, and he will forgive us our sins. If we, if we confess and forsake, he will forgive us and cleanse us of our sins. Recognize and submit to his discipline. For whom the Lord loves, he chasteneth. God is our only hope. There is no one or nowhere else to turn. Only God forgives sins. And repentance means transformation. If you haven't been transformed, if your direction has been changed, if your way of thinking is the same as it was before, you haven't repented, you've just said, doggone, this was rough, I don't like it. And there's a difference, right? There's a difference. Repentance means transformation. It's trusting in and relying on the Spirit to change your mind and to change your direction in life. Every prayer of repentance must lead and end in commitment to do right, to live responsibly, and to joyfully follow God's agenda for your life. And the result of Jonah's prayer was that the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah upon the dry land. And then, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I'll say it in verse 3, and then the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Oh, I love that verse. Praise God that he not only delivers repentant sinners, but he restores the repentant sinner. Our God is a God of not just second chances, but all kind of chances. And we need to be delighted that God consistently restores and reconciles us to his purposes. So let's stand together. And once we stand, let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Sean and the musicians are on their way up here. They're, gonna, they're going to uh, lead us into a, a closing hymn. Maybe you need to respond uh, where, right where you sit uh, or, uh, or up here at the altar. You know, we had some this morning who wanted to pray for family and who wanted to present themselves for uh, baptism. I don't know how the Lord may be uh, speaking to you based on what we were reminded of from Jonah. But if you need to respond, um, as, we, uh, as the musicians play right now, and as Sean just goes ahead and starts to sing with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you need to respond, you come. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art the throne of mercy, find a sweet relief, kneeling there in deep contrition, help my the 
Thou art calling, do not pass me by. You know, the blessed fact of the matter is that he won't. I, I think, uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, I'm wanting to say it was Mark 5 that... Um, Mark 5 or Mark 6, probably Mark, Mark 5, where, uh, where that hymn may have been drawn from. Remember, Jesus and the disciples have crossed over the Sea of Galilee, and Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, has uh, gathered them together, and he's going to go to his, his house because Jairus' daughter, 12-year-old 12, 12 girl, his only daughter, is lying about to die, and there's this great press around Jesus, as there always is, and uh, the, the, uh, the woman with the affliction of blood, you know, she, uh, you know, she touched the hem of his garment, and, uh, and, and Jesus stopped uh, for her. And another instance is blind Bartimaeus in, in Mark chapter 9, and this great press of people as Jesus is making his way through Jericho to Jerusalem, and he cried out, um, uh, Son of David, uh, Master, have mercy on me, and, and Jesus stopped for him. The, my point is, if you call out, just as Jonah did, if you call out, Guess what he will not do? He will not pass you by. He will not. He will not. So let's do it. Let's call out to him and, and, and trust him for his goodness and his grace. Thank you for being here tonight. Remember our prayer request. Remember these things. We talked about the Randolphs and, uh, and, and, and Brother Lunsford and, and, and Brother Danny mentioned in his prayer um, um, uh, Eddie's uh, sister and we talked about Amanda's family. Uh, I'd ask you to pray for mine. And, and we're headed out as soon as, uh, I, I won't be around when, this, when the service is dismissed. Um, can we say a special prayer for Dan Dodd? He is following the Lord and moving to Omaha, Nebraska. I'm yeah. going to cry. He leaves this week. He's my other son. Is that right? Is that you up there, Dan? You're leaving for Nebraska. Yeah. Well, absolutely. We can pray for you, and, and, uh, and we'll, do that. Uh, we'll do that right now as we're dismissed. When do you leave? Thursday. So it, uh, we're talking soon. Yeah. We're talking real soon. Where at Nebraska? Uh, a town called Vista. Okay. You going to punch cattle up there? Is that what you're doing? No, actually, I'm, I'm working with another chick play out there. Okay. Well, fantastic. I run into him every time I'm in Somerset, because every time I'm in Somerset, I find myself in Chick-fil-A. And uh, I ran into Dan there. So I'm, I'm going to miss that, I guess, uh, from now on. Uh, so you're leaving Thursday. And uh, let's go ahead and pray for these requests. And let's pray for Dan specifically. And, uh, and Lori, too. She's losing a son in, in a lot of ways as he heads out uh, to Nebraska. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be praying for you tonight and be praying for you uh, in, in the days and weeks to come. Okay, Dan? Thank you. Well, praise God. Let's go ahead and pray right now. Brother Hal Hunt, would you close us in prayer and would you pray especially for Dan as he heads out? Well, I think it's a privilege that we have in the house tonight, Father. Father, we just uh, thank you for your word. We just thank you for the truth of your word. Truth that's been preached here today, Father. Father, may we always be, be uh, meditate on your word, Father. And Father, we just uh, especially pray for Dan and I as he embarks on a new journey, Father. Just put a hedge around him, Father. And Father, for the other prayer requests that's been mentioned, Father, just be with each one of them, especially for Brother Travis as he travels. Father, we love you and we praise you. Father, just as we leave this place, just dismiss. Dismiss us in your care. We trust in your presence. Amen.